Assess Assessment webinar. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce two of the greatest presenters ever to grace our webinar airwaves, Micah Comp and Lainey Picard. Micah and Lainey? Good morning. Uh, thank you, Chris uh, and Michelle, for that, for that uh, gracious introduction. Um, my name is Micah Comp. I am the Quality Assurance Manager for DSS, uh, Industrial Security Field Operations. My office is responsible for ensuring consistency within DSS. We also ensure uh, efficiency. We drive process improvements. And we also provide operational support to our DSS field activities and to organizations like CDSC for presentations like this. Also with me today is uh, Lainey Picard. Thanks, Micah. Hi, everybody. My name is Lainey Picard, and I'm a Senior Quality Assurance Action Officer for the Quality Assurance and Field Support Branch under Mr. Micah Kump. And I will let you take away the presentation right now, Micah. Thanks, Lainey. OK. Before we begin uh, our discussion of the vulnerability assessments, which is what I think we're all here, we thought it was important to provide some background on the DSS approach, the strategy, and the implementation of our responsibilities within the National Industrial Security Program. We thought that this will help you not only understand and place your security vulnerability assessment in a larger context, but will hopefully help you understand how this process assists industry, assists the government, and ensures the protection of our nation's most critical assets. So the DSS approach to security vulnerability assessments is through a true partnership with industry. We understand that industry protects classified information entrusted to them, and that this protection is a shared responsibility between government and industry. Ultimately, though, primary responsibility for the protection of that classified information resides with industry. It's in your companies. It's with you guys. Therefore, it is entrusted to you to protect it. DSS is here not only to oversee the protection of classified information, but to provide advice assistance, and support to industry when needed. Partnership is and continues to be a priority for DSS and is recognized as the best approach for protecting classified information. Now that we've talked a little bit about our approach, we think it's important for us also to talk about our strategy. It is important to understand how vulnerabilities and the vulnerability assessment fits into DSS's larger risk-based oversight approach, which you can see above, extends beyond vulnerabilities and the vulnerability assessment. What you see on this slide is an equation that depicts how DSS views risk. In short, risk is a function of threat, vulnerability, and consequence value. But what does this really mean? So in order to understand risk, DSS weighs and considers three primary factors. First is the threat. And you can see that right after that big F in the slide above. This is the threat to the classified information or the sensitive technology at your companies. As you can see above, threat is identified through a variety of means. But primarily, this information comes from an understanding generated by those suspicious contact reports that you provide to DSS. Next are vulnerabilities and the primary focus of today's session. Vulnerabilities are both known and unknown, but in short, they are failures in our own security programs or posture that may allow our adversaries to obtain classified or sensitive technologies. So above are examples of where vulnerabilities may originate. So you can see in that center column under vulnerabilities, we've got vulnerability assessments. We have IT accreditations and CCRIs, technology control plans security violations. So within these processes, if they're not executed correctly, is where we will see vulnerabilities generate. The last part of this equation is consequence value. This is the consequence to the United States if the technology or information is lost. And what's important here is the value of the information or technology to our adversaries. This is not what is necessarily valuable to us, per se, but the value to our adversaries. So next, Lainey is going to talk a little bit about our approach uh, and the strategy and how it is implemented. Thanks, Micah. DSS publishes a quarterly internal facilities of interest list, better known as the FIL, to prioritize vulnerability assessments and oversight in the field. This publication is classified and therefore non-releasable to industry. 
This is DSS's prioritization model and determines the level of risk for the facilities as they relate to vulnerabilities and the overall threat specific to technologies. It assists DSS in prioritization of how often your DSS ISRAP conducts SVAs within your facility, whether that be 12, 18, or 36 months. This approach supports the National Counterintelligence Strategy of the United States as well as the DOD Counterintelligence Strategy. The main goal of the fill is a coordinated, integrated visit from DSS to the right facility at the right time with appropriate resources resulting in a more effective, meaningful assessment. There are a little over 13,500 facilities in the National Industrial Security Program currently. The FIL provides a four-tier risk-based model prioritizing facilities based on assets, threats, and value consequence. It is, in essence, how we implement the risk equation model Micah spoke about earlier. Every company in the NISP is assigned a tier level, one through four, based on known assets, known risks, targeted technologies, and several other contributing factors. Tier one are considered the highest risk facilities, while tier two are medium risk. Tier one and two facilities are assessed more frequently, typically every 12 months, based on these known risk factors, while tier three and four may be assessed less frequently every 18 to 36 months as they are considered lower risk. It is possible for companies to shift between tiers based on reported information to DSS, evolving threats specific to technologies and information, and additional contributing elements or circumstances. As of note, the SVA date may be extended by six months if a facility receives a superior or commendable security rating at its most recent SVA. So now that we have talked a little bit about our approach, strategy, and implementation, let's discuss the security vulnerability assessment. The graphic on this slide depicts the elements that make up a security vulnerability assessment. So what is the purpose of the DSS assessment? The DSS assessments ensure security countermeasures are in place to mitigate hostile intelligence threats and ensure national policy compliance. DSS uses a tailored risk-based approach, as we've already discussed, to assess and enhance the security posture of over 10,000 cleared companies and, as Laney pointed out, over 13,500 locations. More specifically, the assessment evaluates a contractor's security, processes, and procedures, adherence to suspicious contact and other reporting requirements. It identifies vulnerabilities. It advises your government contracting activities of any substandard programs or issues, and in serious cases, it identifies compromises of classified information. You will notice that not all areas are applicable to all facilities. Some facilities may not have information systems or foci factors, but there are some elements such as security education that are relevant to all companies in the NIST. In addition, you will notice that all of these security measures are designed to protect classified and sensitive information from the threat. Next, Delaney is going to talk about how DSS defines vulnerabilities. There are currently three categories of vulnerabilities. An acute vulnerability is defined as non-compliance with an NISPOM requirement that puts classified information at imminent risk of loss or compromise. A critical vulnerability is defined as non-compliance with an NISPOM requirement that places classified information in danger of loss or compromise. Once a vulnerability is determined to be acute or critical, it is further categorized as either isolated, systemic, or repeat. Isolated refers to a single occurrence that resulted in or could logically lead to the loss or compromise of classified information. Systemic refers to a specific requirement as deficient in multiple areas as a result of there not being a process in place or an existing process is not adequately designed to comply. For instance, if a security program was one-third deficient in a specific area across the program, it would be considered systemic. Repeat is a specific occurrence identified during the last vulnerability assessment that has not been properly corrected. Please note, although some repeat vulnerabilities may be administrative in nature and not directly place classified information at risk to loss or compromise, 
it is documented as critical as it demonstrates noncompliance. All other vulnerabilities are defined as noncompliance within a NISPOM requirement that does not place classified information in danger of loss or compromise. Based on what you know now regarding vulnerabilities, let's review three possible scenarios and determine the type of vulnerability for each scenario. Please use the chat box to respond with your answer. Scenario number one. A cleared employee discloses classified information to a non-cleared employee. Go ahead and please answer, enter your answer into the chat box now. Okay, we're getting a lot of acute answers, a couple criticals. Okay, great. If you answered acute isolated vulnerability, you are correct. This is considered an acute isolated vulnerability because classified information has been disclosed to an individual without the proper eligibility, access, and need to know. Let's try another one. A facility did not provide annual training to its five cleared employees, Helen Smith, Roger Banks, Mary Jones, James Cook, and Bill Owens. The same vulnerability, no annual training provided to the same five cleared employees, was cited during the last vulnerability assessment. Please go ahead and enter your answer now. Okay, everyone is saying repeat, excellent. So if you answered critical repeat vulnerability, you are correct. While the vulnerability itself is administrative in nature, the fact that it was cited during the last vulnerability assessment makes it repetitive in nature and therefore it is automatically elevated to a critical vulnerability. Let's try one more. The SSO did not destroy a new employee's SF-86 after the employee's personnel clearance was granted. What does everyone think this one is? Go ahead and enter your answer now. Okay, we're getting a couple critical isolated, acute, plain old vulnerability. Lots of people are saying just plain vulnerability. And that is correct. So if you answered vulnerability on this, great job. This vulnerability did not place classified information at risk of loss or compromise. However, it is considered an instance of noncompliance within the NISPOM. Great job, everybody. Okay, so now we are going to do a, a poll question. What do you think is the most frequently identified security vulnerability? Please go ahead and enter your answer. The three that we have are inadequate security education, not auditing and reviewing classified systems, and classified access without proper eligibility. We're going to give a couple of seconds here for everybody to respond. Okay, it looks like most folks are saying inadequate security education. Let's see where we are. Okay, it looks like we have a winner. Now let's look at vulnerability trends and see if we were right. The top vulnerability is inadequate security education training and awareness. So good security education programs will ensure that cleared employees are aware of their responsibility to protect classified information. Daily, thousands of cleared individuals across industry access, share, and transmit and generate classified information. It is critical that these individuals have the knowledge necessary to protect this information, yet DS, DSS finds that this is often an area that is most overlooked. Untrained individuals can mishandle classified information and unwittingly place classified information at risk, not because of malice or intent, but because they just did not know any better. As security professionals, you can ensure that cleared employees in your organizations are trained and know how to protect classified information. Our second most commonly cited vulnerability relates to individuals accessing classified information without proper eligibility. As you can see, the second most common vulnerability directly relates to the first. If individuals are properly trained, I think we would also see our second most common vulnerability greatly reduced. Together, these two vulnerabilities account for over 31% of vulnerabilities DSS identified last year. 
After today's session, ask yourself, do I have this problem? Perhaps when you conduct your self-inspection, spend a little more time looking at these two areas just to be sure. So you can take a look here and you can see additional areas that DSS finds. We track these every year and we will again look at focus areas based off of this information. So each year DSS tracks vulnerabilities to identify trends and develop these focus areas. We use training sessions like the one you're attending today to educate industry about these trends in an effort to reduce vulnerabilities. For 2015, DSS is focusing on four specific areas during the security vulnerability assessment. We're going to be looking at personnel security. We're going to be looking at incident reporting. This includes adverse information, culpability reporting, oversight of classified computer systems, and security education and training. You can see that our focus areas directly relate to the vulnerability identification trends we discussed on the last page. So we've already discussed two of the focus areas, but now let's discuss classified computer systems and IT vulnerabilities. We understand that this doesn't apply to all cleared companies in the NIST, but those which have accredited computer systems from DSS. Within industry, DSS accredits computer systems to protect classified information. Once a contractual requirement is identified requiring processing of classified information, a contractor must submit a plan to DSS outlining how the system will be configured and protected in accordance with NISPOM requirements. During this process, DSS reviews these plans and also conducts on-site validation to ensure secure processing of classified information. While DSS does not consider submission deficiencies specifically as vulnerabilities, we want to discuss them here today as they could lead to vulnerabilities if not properly addressed. So the top five deficiencies we're seeing in system security plans are on the slide above, but I'm going to talk a little bit about them. An SPP was incomplete or missing attachments, inaccurate or incomplete configuration diagrams. This means what's happening in the real world doesn't match what's in your plan. Sections in general procedures contradict the protection profile. It's important that all parts of your plan are accurate. So this is just general inaccuracy with the plans that are being submitted. We also, want to, we also see uh, integrity and availability is not properly addressed, and the SPP is not tailored to the system. So DSS provides templates to industry to assist in the accreditation process, but sometimes we find that those templated plans are not specifically tailored to your systems and represent your environment for your computer systems. So now that we've talked a little bit about vulnerabilities, next let's talk about enhancements. DSS updated the security rating matrix in October of 2014. This change consisted of splitting Category 7, formerly CI integration, into two distinct categories, 7A, Threat Identification and Management, and 7B, Threat Mitigation. There are FAQs available on the specifics of this change under the File Share section of this presentation. NISP enhancement categories were established based on practical areas to simplify and ensure field consistency. They enhance protection of classified information beyond the baseline NISPOM standards. Enhancements are validated as having an effective impact on the overall security program through things like employee interviews as well as review of the process and procedures implemented at your facility. Full credit for a NISP enhancement will be given to facilities that complete any action or item in a given category. They will also be granted to facilities that meet the baseline NISPOM requirements in that area. With the update in October of 2014, DSS also updated the rating matrix document, which can also be found under the file share in this webinar. Please feel free to download as a reference before or after the presentation. Let's put together what we've learned about vulnerabilities and NISP enhancements and how these play a part in your security vulnerability assessment. At the completion of the SVA, your IS rep will evaluate your overall program to identify any vulnerabilities, whether they're acute, critical, or administrative in nature, as well as any identified NISP enhancements by category. DSS uses a numerical-based rating system as a tool in evaluating security programs. Let's discuss what that means exactly. Throughout the scope of your SVA, your assigned IS rep may identify vulnerabilities and or NISP enhancements. 
The Security Rating Matrix Calculation Worksheet is utilized to assist in identification of an overall rating for your facility's security program. All facilities begin with 700 points. Based on your security program size and complexity, points are subtracted for vulnerabilities by NISPON reference. Acute or critical and administrative vulnerabilities are weighted separately. Points are then added if NISP enhancements have been identified, so long as the facility has met the baseline NISPOM requirements in that specific area. An enhancement directly related to a NISPOM requirement cited for a vulnerability will not be granted. A final score is then determined and a rating is assigned based on your final numerical score, which captures both vulnerabilities and NISP enhancements. Your ISREP should provide you with a copy of your Security Rating Matrix Calculation Worksheet as a follow-up to your SVA. So you can now see that during the Security Vulnerability Assessment, DSS considers not only vulnerabilities, but also activities that enhance your security program. Taken together, these contribute to the final rating that DSS will assign your facility. DSS will issue one of five ratings at the conclusion of the Security Vulnerability Assessment. The definitions for each of these ratings are outlined in an Industrial Security Letter, which is available in the document section of this presentation. But let's discuss each of these in a little more detail. A superior security rating is our highest rating, reserved for contractors that have consistently and fully implemented the requirements of the NISPOM in an effective fashion resulting in a security posture of the highest caliber compared with other contractors of similar size and complexity. A commendable security rating is also very high and is assigned to contractors that have fully implemented the requirements of the NISPOM in an effective fashion resulting in an exemplary security posture. A satisfactory security rating is our most common rating. It denotes that the contractor security program is in general conformity with NISPOM requirements. Remember, a satisfactory security rating is a good rating. It means that you are meeting the requirements set out by the government and in the NISPOM. The next two ratings mean that your security program has problems that need to be addressed and in some cases may indicate significant issues including a loss of classified information. A marginal rating is assigned when a contractor security program is not in general conformity with the basic NISPOM requirements. This can occur if there are a lot of vulnerabilities or if there is a general breakdown in security within a company or a facility. An unsatisfactory rating is the most serious security rating. This rating is assigned when circumstances and conditions indicate that a contractor has lost or is in imminent danger of losing its ability to adequately safeguard the classified information in its possession or to which it has access. So let's pull it all together. Now that you have an understanding of the DSS approach, our strategy, and implementation, and you have an understanding of the security vulnerability assessment, let's discuss the results of these assessments nationwide. Overall, industry does very good during DSS security vulnerability assessments. Less than 1% of our assessments result in a marginal or unsatisfactory rating. In FY14, we saw approximately 28% of facilities exceed the baseline NISPOM requirements and achieve a higher than satisfactory rating. This is an increase from what we saw in 2013 and a reflection on an upward trend in the security posture within industry. So keep up the good work. Each and every day, you work diligently to protect national security and it is showing. I want to thank each and every one of you for your commitment and for taking the time out of your busy schedules to attend today's training. I, do. I know we don't have much time left, but I'm going to turn it back over to Chris. And if we have some time, uh, we'll take a few questions. All right, thank you, uh, Micah and Lainey. Um, we do have uh, just a couple minutes, so let's see if we can at least sneak one of the questions that came in in. And the, that question is, uh, I am an FSL of a small non-possessing facility. Is it possible for my company to earn a commendable or superior? Uh, I can take this. Okay. Uh, I would say yes, it is absolutely possible. Uh, for a small non-possessing facility to earn a commendable or superior rating. The rating matrix is designed through weighing vulnerabilities and NISP enhancements differently and separately to allow all companies, regardless of the size or complexity, to achieve a higher than satisfactory rating. 
So for a small non-possessing company, NISP enhancements are weighted slightly more than for a larger possessing company. However, at the same token, if a critical vulnerability is identified, it is also weighted slightly more than for the larger possessing company. So with that in mind, I would recommend concentrating on establishing a strong and sound security program that meets the baseline NISPOM requirements in uh, any area in which security activities are implemented beyond these baseline requirements, you may receive NISP enhancement credit. So I would recommend reviewing the attached document and the file share for some examples of enhancements for each category, and that is titled the Vulnerability Assessment Rating Matrix 2014 Update. Thanks, Lainey. Um, we're really running short a little bit of time here, so we're going to move on. The answer to that question and the others we got, that we have um, received today will be posted to our webinar archive page within the next few weeks, so keep a lookout for those. But before we end this webinar, there's one last activity I'd like you to help us out with, and that is our survey. You should see a survey box appear on your screen. Once you see that, just follow the prompts and answer the questions before you log out today. It should only take you a few minutes as it is very brief, but the information you provide is invaluable to our continued webinar success. Uh, again, thank you to Micah and Lainey. Your knowledge and expertise was greatly appreciated, and I know that I'm leaving here knowing more about vulnerabilities in DSS assessment process than I did 30 minutes ago. And I'd also like to offer special thanks to all of you for taking your time out to attend today's webinar. These webinars are a great training opportunity, and we're so glad you continue to take advantage of them. Don't forget to join us for our upcoming webinars, April 9th, Industry's Role in the CNA Process, May 14th, ITAR, and June 11th, the NID Process. Keep checking our webinar website for registration information for those webinars. That about does it for us today. Remember, don't ever miss an opportunity to learn at lunch. I want to thank you for spending part of your day with us. Enjoy what is left of it, of course, after you finish your survey. And we'll see you all real soon. Thanks again. Bye-bye. This concludes today's teleconference. Thank you all for your attendance. You may disconnect at this time.